As we prepare to read our scripture for this morning, let us turn our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of life, you call us to love our neighbors no matter who they might be. Send your Holy Spirit as we listen for your word, for your call. Teach us how to be your disciples in the world and inspire us to greet all in your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the gospel of Mark chapter 10. And before we read it together, I just want to share a little bit about this scripture. It is found in all three of the synoptic gospels. And the three synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is often referred to this passage as the rich young ruler because Matthew says the man was young and Luke says the man was a ruler. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that this man was rich. When a gospel story is found in not one but all three of those synoptic gospels, it is important for us to ponder why. Perhaps this story is inviting us to consider who we are and perhaps to rediscover who we are called to be. Christ is inviting us into this story. So listen now for God's word for you. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked. And went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed by these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I think Marie Kondo probably loves this passage. For those of you who do not know who Marie Kondo is, she is an organizing consultant who has written several books and has a popular TV show on Netflix called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. 
Her whole theory surrounding organizing has to do with whether or not your things spark joy in you. And so her method involves you literally taking out everything you own and deciding what brings you joy and getting rid of the rest. So I'll come back to that in a minute, to why I think she might appreciate what Jesus is saying in this passage, but we need to back up and reorient ourselves to where we are in Scripture. If you remember last week, we were with the transfiguration on top of the mountain. And with that story, we sort of kind of passed the halfway mark, in the halfway point in the Gospel of Mark. Prior to last week, we were in the early stages of Jesus' ministry, but now we're on this wilderness path, this journey to the cross. The message about the kingdom within the gospel is growing increasingly relevant, and it is critical, and it is challenging people to reevaluate who they are and what they are doing. Take the man in this morning's scripture, for example. He runs up to Jesus, kneels before him, and asks, What must I do to inherit eternal life? After Jesus reminds him of the commandments, the man affirms that he has followed these commandments since he was a young boy. But then Jesus says there is one more thing. You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying that you can follow all of the commandments, but if you really want to inherit eternal life, if you really want to have joy in heaven, you have to get rid of all of your stuff. Can you understand why I think Marie Kondo probably appreciates this story? But I don't think Jesus is talking about this idea of minimalism that is going on right now. Instead, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus goes on to further explain to his disciples how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Then he offered that outlandish metaphor, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now for those of you currently listing off all the things in your head that you really do not want to get rid of in order to get to heaven, know that you are in good company. Jesus' words weren't really well received. The rich man heard these words, became sad, and walked away. The disciples also, if you read through that, really seem a little bit frustrated by this. Peter even exclaims to Jesus, look, we have left everything and followed you. It's almost as if he's saying, Jesus, what more do you want from us? And I suppose we could ask the same question today. We are here, are we not? We come to church, we participate in the life of the community, we pledge our money, we volunteer our time, we care for one another, we donate and participate in service and mission together. What more does Jesus want from us? Can't we at least keep some of our stuff? But I don't think Jesus is categorically saying keeping our stuff means we can't get to heaven. But he is saying that the way we choose to value that stuff, the way we choose to value it over other people or over our love for God keeps us from living a kingdom of God kind of life. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the comic strip Coffee with Jesus. It's about somebody having coffee with Jesus and having some deep thoughts over coffee. So take a look at this one. The first scene there says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want very much. 
Jesus says again, and from the top. So Anne says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, well, what, oh, but here, but there is so much that I actually do want, Jesus. Jesus says, I'm afraid this is a King James thing, Anne. Let's try, the Lord is my shepherd, and I've got pretty much everything I need. I love this comic strip. I love this one in particular because it reminds me to reorient myself to God. Like Anne, there is so much that we want. We look at those shiny new things as if they have the power to make us finally happy or make us complete or to spark that joy within us. If only our house were bigger. If only I had a new car. If only I could send my children to that school. For Marie Kondo, perhaps, it's only, if only your house was clutter-free and full of the things that only spark joy. But as Jesus tells Anne in this comic strip, as he tells his disciple, and as he tells us, the Lord is my shepherd, I've got pretty much everything I need. Our ultimate satisfaction won't come from our relentless pursuit of stuff. It comes from resting in God's provision and knowing that we are loved. I think sometimes we get caught up in the weeds of scripture, especially this one. And we focus too much on what Jesus is calling us to give away that we miss the important lessons in the text. Lessons about the kingdom of God and how we live out our faith. Lessons that go far beyond decluttering. There are a couple of things I want to make sure that we notice in this passage. At the very beginning, after their initial conversation, and before Jesus gives the man his assignment to sell the possessions, we hear this. Jesus, looking at this man, loved him. You might be surprised to know that with the exception of the beloved disciple in John's gospel, this is the only instance in which Jesus is said to love a person. Presumably, Jesus loved countless people. Indeed, we can say that he loved everyone he met. But Mark makes a point of actually saying that Jesus loved this rich man. I wonder if it's because Mark wants to be, make it clear that what Jesus is about to say is going to be hard, but it's said out of love. And then there's the reference to Jesus looking at the man. This is more than just a matter of Jesus simply casting a glance in one direction. The implication is that Jesus truly sees this man that is before him. And he he sees where he stands in relation to the kingdom of God. Jesus really knows this man better than the man knows himself. And Jesus has diagnosed this man's problem and is about to prescribe the treatment. There are cues also throughout this entire story that Mark intends for us to see this as another healing story. We are told that the man runs to Jesus. And the only other place that somebody runs to Jesus is in chapter 5 of Mark where the man is possessed with a legion of demons and Jesus sets him free. We are told that the rich man comes and kneels before Jesus and three times in Mark's gospel we see someone kneeling before Jesus. There was a leper who was seeking to be healed from Jesus. There was Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, who wanted Jesus to come and heal his dying daughter. And there's the woman who kneeled at Jesus' feet to just touch the hem of his cloak to receive a healing from the affliction of the nonstop flow of blood. On some level of his being, this rich man has modeled and come 
forward to Jesus in need of healing. On the surface, he has everything in the world that we say is important. Money, respectability, and yet there is a profound emptiness inside of him. And he comes to Jesus seeking a healing of his heart. The man in this story is very proud of himself, for he has followed those commandments throughout all of his life. He even added that he has kept them from since the time he was a little boy. But Jesus says there is much more to coming into the kingdom of God than that. Jesus says that it is not just about following the commandments, but about how we live our lives and the attention behind every decision we make. This is not about the commandments. This is about the kingdom. The man walked up desiring healing and asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In one sense, I think the answer really is nothing. We can't earn it. We can't buy it or wish it or wish our way into salvation. It is a gift of grace to which we respond with abundant gratitude. Jesus himself says, for mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. The Lord is my shepherd, and I've got pretty much everything I need. In another sense, I wonder if the answer to this question, though, is literally everything, like Jesus said. We have to give all that we are. We have to trust all that we have into the keeping and provision of God from whom all blessings flow. Because the life God envisions for us is better than anything we can dream up. At the end of this story, we don't know what happened to the man We are told that he was sad and that he walked away because he had a lot of possessions. But I hope, I hope that as he walked away, he knew that Jesus really did see him when he looked at him. And he knew that Jesus really did love him and call him beloved And that he understood that no possession that we have on earth is greater than the reality of the provision of knowing that we are loved. For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. The Lord is my shepherd. I've got pretty much everything I need. Thanks be to God. Amen.